spend your happy hour time with us here at the Woodrow Wilson Center's China Environment Forum. Um, my name is Jennifer Turner. A bunch of you know me. Some of you don't, but I direct the China Environment Forum, and I've been here for 15 years and maybe some change, um, putting on meetings, creating, not by myself, I have a great team, my, Susan Shiflett and, and a great gaggle of interns over the years, um, uh, putting on meetings, creating publications, infographics, and acting as a matchmaker on all things energy and environment in China. That's a lot, isn't it? It's, it's a small, you know, small country. Small issues, no. Um, we've done a lot of work over the years on water energy confrontations, climate issues, food safety, and you know, we, uh, for some reason we keep migrating back to the issue of air quality in China. Yeah. Maybe because it's front page news. And if you, in case you didn't get the memo, about a year and a half ago the Chinese government declared that they are on a war against pollution after a number of years, you know this stuff, most of you here in the audience, of, of really severe smog blanketing the cities in North China. So we are now at war, been at war for a while now. And just not very long ago, there's been a new weapon added to the arsenal to fight this pollution. China, after 15 years of, and it's, you know, they had an air pollution law that was passed 15 years ago, and they finally amended it. And so we thought it was a great opportunity to grab some people, notably one of our friends from Greenpeace, Lee Schroll, just happened to be in town, so he was gloriously the catalyst for our meeting today, according to his schedule. So, you know, we're going to be talking about looking at this newly amended law that, you know, has got some stricter emission limits, heavier penalties, and, you know, whether it does, you know, and we'll be talking about whether this does have the one-two punch to really help in terms of air quality. But we're going to start off today, we're going to have Steve Wolfson, who's going to get the award for speaking for the second time this year about pollution issues in China, because he, he's close by, easy to grab, but also very smart. He coordinates the US EPA's Office and General Counsel's International Capacity Building Activities. Um, I mean, it's an international office, but it seems like a big hunk of that seems to be your China work, working a lot in, in exchanges and consultations with Ministry of Environmental Protection. Um, EPA Air Office is, is really one of our, it's one, a really bright, one big bright light that we have also working in China on air quality issues. So he's going to start us off talking a bit about the le, because he is indeed a lawyer, um, and he's promised not to be boring. But you guys in the audience, you can throw things at him if it gets a bit dull, but it won't be because Steve's, Steve's, Steve's a fun guy. And then following him, we've got Li Shuo, who is a senior climate and energy policy officer at Greenpeace China, and he covers air pollution, water scarcity, and he looks at energy policy, which, you know, touches a, a wee bit on coal last time I checked, and that um, he's actually been hanging out this year in Germany, in Berlin. And so he's going he's gonna to come in and talk about well, his opinion and what's going on with the air law, what it, and, and also its significance or not significance for China's plan to cap coal. And then, as our closing picture today, we have R.P. Song from WRI, newly relocated to D.C. from Beijing. Do you like our blue skies here today, R.P.? Yes. <laughs> We're, it's, it's incredible. For those of you not in D.C., beautiful blue skies. We are in webcast, everyone, just so you know. Um, yeah, so he's... Um, was heading the China Climate Office at WRI in Beijing, and now taking a broader look at w, heading WRI's global climate program, focusing more on developing countries. Correct? Well, not heading, but you know, one of the heading. Yeah. That's true. It's a very yes. It's a group organization over there. Um, so he's. Um, you guys have the bios. So I'm, I don't like reading bios, but I think the people who were wanted to be timely are indeed timely. So we're going to start off um, with Steve. And just so you know, on the, this the screen back here, this is. Um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, they have this new, it's this Berkeley Earth map that's the air quality in China. It's supposed to, it's supposed to be live and it's nighttime now, so I don't know if it's going to move as much as it does sometimes during the day, but it's, it's going to be our backdrop for our conversation on air. I want to thank all of you again for coming. And Steve, you going to come up here and talk? Uh, you're closer so I can hit you if you're, if you're sure. going over time. All right, good. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Jennifer, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's great to be back here at the Wilson Center. Uh, I was just here in April talking about new amendments to the framework environmental protection law, uh, which took effect January 1st. And the beat goes on, and now we have a new air law in China. Um, so I'm going to talk first uh, a little bit about, I'll focus on the air law, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the context and then about some of the key provisions in the new law and then a few questions or issues to watch going forward. And I think folks in this crowd are probably familiar with the, the World Health Organization estimates of 
over a million people, uh, premature deaths uh, annually from outdoor air pollution in China. And now there's this debate, actually, uh, because Berkeley Earth has some new calculations that suggest that even that alarming number is too low and that actually uh, it's closer to 1.6 premature deaths a year from just from outdoor air pollution, not counting indoor air pollution. So one of the drivers for China's efforts to reduce air pollution is uh, concern about health impacts. And you see this uh, in the interest in the pollution map apps. You see this in the uh, interest in the pollution documentary on the, under the dome. Um, and those both illustrate the high level of concern and the broad concern throughout the Chinese population. Another driver is concern about climate change impacts, impacts on agriculture, impacts on coastal populations, and other impacts. Then a third driver is the desire for energy security. And then a fourth driver for addressing air pollution in China is the growing recognition of the synergies between reducing pollution and moving away from an economy that's uh, unbalanced and, and focused on heavy industry and exports to a more balanced, more sustainable uh, economy for the long term. Uh, people in China are becoming increasingly assertive on these issues. Uh, the theme from the bottom is that we want clean air to breathe. And uh, they know this problem can be tackled. They see it uh, when the sky, uh, before a big public event like APEC Blue or Military Parade Blue, uh, when the sky uh, is clear for a few days, and then they see it, uh, how depressing it must be when kind of the sparkle of that blue sky disappears after the event and the pollution gumbo returns. Uh, but it does show that the air pollution is not permanent. And China has established ambitious targets that are going to require significant effort, some of these efforts already underway, uh, that diverge uh, from a business-as-usual scenario. So my pitch on context is that the air law should not be viewed in isolation. It builds on and it consolidates reforms that were announced in the 2013 Clean Air Action Plan. And that's part of the reason why we're already seeing reports from Greenpeace and Clean Air Alliance of China and others, that air pollution is declining in many of the most heavily polluted areas. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Beijing's got the app. Beijing, AQI right now, 21. It's green. Probably it, there's, better than DC. It's better, shh, could be better than DC. <laughs> but they're sleeping now. But it's, it, that's incredibly low and green. All right, I'll check DC too for you. All right. So yeah, I can't remember seeing a, no, a, a number that low uh, in Beijing. Um, uh, so, declining air pollution, uh, and uh, but the job is not done, not by a long shot. So, the air law revisions are part of a wave of environmental law reform. So, it's helpful to look at them in that context. There's a sequence from the action plan in 2013, the buildup of the air quality monitoring systems in dozens of cities around China, the joint announcement with the U.S. on climate, and then China's subsequent uh, nationally determined contribution that they submitted to the UN for the climate negotiations uh, that built on the joint announcement with the US uh, and incorporated it and then had a couple of new elements to it. Uh, the air law amendments that were just passed uh, and then into the future with implementing regulations on the law, on the new air law, and then the 13th five year plan to be issued next year. So, Switching to focus, to sort of zoom in now on the air law. Uh, it was approved August 31st, takes effect January 1st, uh, 2016, and it addresses some key issues. Uh, one of them is air quality standards, and in particular, there are some provisions there on transparency. So there's a provision on soliciting input on proposed standards, and another provision on then publishing final standards, Articles 10 and 11 of the new law. There's also an interesting provision that calls for the government to reevaluate the standards periodically. It doesn't say how often, but the idea that when there's new data, you need to take another look at the standard and determine whether the standard you've got is the right standard or not. So uh, periodic reevaluation and perhaps updating of standards. And then there are also some provisions that go to how to strengthen implementation of uh, clean air 
law and policy in China. So there's a provision on um, public disclosure of plans for meeting targets in Article 15. Article 17 has, a, has provision on evaluating attainment of targets. Uh, and we understand that this is already happening. Uh, Beijing has already been calling in the mayors of some of the cities that are missing their targets, calling for new plans and, and timetables. And so I think one of the questions here is going to be, what kind of oversight authority is the Ministry of Environmental Protection or other parts of the national government going to have when local officials fall behind on their targets? Is this something that's going to be handled solely through the performance evaluation mm -hmm. system, the key performance indicators, or are there also going to be legal tools for making sure that they, uh, that they come into what we would call attainment, that they meet their standards? Um, one indicator that China's thinking about regulatory tools to supplement the performance indicators is that the new law includes a provision on suspending approvals of new pollution sources in areas that are missing their targets. And there is a similar uh, provision in the revisions to the framework environmental protection law last year. Uh, so this is a potentially very important um, tool for making sure that governments uh, feel the incentive to actually meet the targets that, that have been set in Beijing. So another issue that is addressed in the law is the issue of air pollution that's transported from, you know, in the air from one jurisdiction to another, from one city to another, or from one province to another. The air pollution doesn't respect borders at all. Um, so this is another aspect of strengthening implementation, addressing air pollution transport. And the uh, provision on this recognizes that it's not enough to simply assign responsibility for meeting targets to the local officials. You also need to take account of the fact that sometimes the pollution comes from somewhere else. So there's a provision to set up a mechanism for coordination across provincial boundaries. Mm. Uh, joint prevention and control systems, they call it, in uh, Article 86. And then there's Article 89 has a provision on notification of a neighboring province about a project that may impair their air quality, mm -hmm. and then a requirement to hold a consultation with that other province. So very, uh, I think, significant step forward. Um, questions, you know, what happens? if the consultation does not resolve the issue. Does the government of the downwind area have legal recourse to challenge a plan or a permit that impairs its attainment? Does the Ministry of Environmental Protection have authority to block a project that's going to cause a downwind area to miss its targets? Uh, so these are some of the questions that, that, that I see there. Um, so there's this sort of cascade, right? We talk first about air quality standards, ambient standards. Then there's the plans at the provincial uh, and, and city level. And then there's the actual pollution sources themselves, the actual factories and power plants and other pollution sources. Uh, so what's happening there in the law? Well, there's a, there's a provision in Article 19 prohibiting discharge without permits. Uh, I, I think uh, that's uh, an important step, and there are some questions that that raises for me are whether there's going to be a transparent process for issuing the permits. For example, would there be a public disclosure of a proposed permit before it's issued so that the public in the area can see what would be allowed and maybe provide comments? And then what happens if the proposed permit is, is not strong enough or is missing something like a reporting provisions or other kinds of details? What if there's something important that's missing? Uh, will the Ministry of Environmental Protection have authority to block the permit until the problems are fixed? So maybe these are issues that, uh, that someone else can explain to me <laughs> how they work in China, or maybe these are issues that could actually be spelled out in regulations in the coming year. Um, and there's also some interesting provisions there on recognizing the importance of reliability of data. So there's a provision prohibiting forgery of monitoring data or tampering with monitoring data and a provision on the responsibilities of enterprises for ensuring the accuracy 
of their monitoring data. And then the responsibilities of the environmental protection bureaus to identify, investigate anomalies in the data. Um, then there's some sort of big picture uh, provisions on the energy supply. Uh, Article 42 establishes priority for dispatch of clean energy. Uh, very important step, I think. <laughs> then there's this kind of big picture provision in Article 32 about adjusting the energy structure, promoting clean energy, and reducing coal use. And this is one that people, I think, are watching very closely. Uh, Chris James from Regulatory Assistance Project has blogged about this, uh, and various commentators in China are debating about it. Uh, and part of the debate is about the absence of greater specificity in this provision. So one of the questions uh, that it raises for me is, is there more coming? Is there going to be an extension of coal consumption caps beyond key regions? And what levels are the coal consumption, consumption caps going to be at? Are they going to be uh, tightened? Um, next is, I think, and the last set of provisions I'm, I'm going to mention is the provisions on uh, emissions from ships. Ships are actually a very important source of air pollution that's gotten little attention in China until recently. And to give a sense of perspective of how important ship emissions are, if you took seven of the biggest, the biggest vessels uh, today, um, the that would be equivalent in terms of how much power it produces to a coal-fired power plant of average size in the U.S., 330 megawatts. So, um, so when you add up all these ships, you have a lot of power, a lot of emissions. Um, and to give another sort of sense of the scale, some of the ports in China, like Shanghai, gets 40,000 visits by vessels in a year. Uh, so that's a lot of vessels. That's a lot of pollution if you don't control it at all. Um, using U.S. inventory data uh, and modeling from that, uh, we see in the U.S. that the impact from ship emissions is not just limited to the coastal areas, but actually extends really far inland. And if you're, if you're looking at this on your computer, pull up a map of the U.S. and look at where Nebraska is. <laughs> Quite a distance from the ocean, but they still get some of the air pollution uh, from, the, uh, from the ships. Um, so, you know, in China, shipping accounts for about 8%. Uh, of the of the SOx emissions and over 11 percent of the nitrogen oxide uh, emissions in 2013 data. Um, so this th so these provisions may be among the most significant in the law. And Barbara Finnamore of Natural Resources Defense Council has blogged about this issue uh, since the law was enacted. There's a provision about having ships turn off their diesel engines when they're in the port and use shoreside electric power which in most places is going to be less polluting than burning the diesel that's in the ship. Uh, and then there's also authority for the Ministry of Transportation in China to establish what are called emissions control areas for ships traveling in China's coastal waters. And this ties in with um, a treaty called MARPOL Convention uh, that's uh, uh, implemented by the International Maritime Organization, IMO. And basically the idea is to establish requirements for ships near coastal areas to use cleaner fuels. Mm -hmm. And this reduces SOx and NOx and particulate emissions. Um, like several of the topics that I mentioned, this is one where EPA has been having a lot of discussions with Chinese officials and Chinese uh, environmental experts. And there's a new U.S.-China Green Ports and Vessels initiative that's been announced. And I think Jennifer is working with some of the people involved in that, so maybe we'll have an event on that soon. We are going to have an event on Green Ports. All right. Ports, yeah. Don't steal my thunder. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> uh, so my bottom line is that the air law should be viewed in the context of this wave of measures, including the reforms that preceded it, the action plan, the monitoring systems, increased disclosure, of pollutant levels and, and pollutant emissions, regional coal caps, new standards, enhanced oversight of attainment, stronger enforcement, emissions trading pilots. And that also needs to be viewed uh, in the context of, a, of uh, additional measures that are still on the horizons, the implementing regulations under the air law and the 13th five-year plan. 
Uh, but I think this reinforces the theme that China is in the process of significantly improving its environmental protection system, though there's a lot more work to be done. All right. So, wow. Applause. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. No, I, I have to, um, when, at one point when he was talking about the transboundary pollution issue with air, I had a, a funny flashback to my dissertation, which was actually on water management in China. And I was, I won't name the counties, but I was in one county in, in, in if you read my dissertation, you might know where it is. But anyway, in China, I was in a county, and I was asking them, because they were upstream of all these other counties. And one guy was just, he was just very kind of loose off, kind of chatty. And he says, and I said, well, you know, you have this water emission, these water pollution permit things that they were discussing. They said, oh, it's okay. We just put in the river, it goes downstream. It doesn't bother us. I'm like, really? <laughs> so, but it's, so, but it's actually an encouraging sign that this is being talked about. Because in my dissertation, I went and talked to the then, you know, State Environmental Protection Administration, and they were kind of like, we can't do cross-boundary. Right. I mean, that, that was kind of a surprising thing. Yes and no surprising thing. We can't do cross-boundary. All right. I have more comments, but I'm going to save it. You're going to get on up here and... Yeah. I don't know. Wax poetic on your thoughts on the air pollution law. Talk about coal. Yep. And, and so you click with this. Don't hit that button. It turns it all on. Sure. So just hit okay. that. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks a lot, Jennifer. Uh, I guess uh, at, at the outset, let me just say uh, it's, uh, it's great to be uh, on this side of the camera <laughs> once in a while. I mean, we, we are a big fan of watching uh, your events here uh, over uh, webcast. <laughs> but uh, again, I mean, uh, thanks for uh, having us. This no, time. Thanks for coming. Um, so, uh, I mean, before I dive into, the, dive into the details, let me just give you uh, guys a few quick words uh, about uh, my organization, Greenpeace China. Uh, we've been there for the past uh, 12, 13 years uh, in uh, mainland China. And we currently have five working areas, climate energy, that's the team that I belong to, um, toxics, working on water pollution, chemical control, uh, food and agriculture, big issue in China, of course. And then two more um, uh, internationally oriented team, forests um, and ocean. Uh, we have now, I think, close to 100 people uh, working uh, there in the Beijing office. As, as far as I know, probably uh, the largest, if not one of the largest uh, NGOs um, in China. I remember when you guys were formed? There were like two yeah. people. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> exactly. So. Um, for the climate energy work that we do, um, heavily concentrated on coal, and we, we tend to unpack the coal issue uh, from three different uh, angles. First one is air pollution. That's, uh, I mean, coal combustion contributes to uh, about half of China's PM 2.5. And then uh, one thing that we overlap with Jennifer here a lot uh, is uh, the coal water um, angle. Um, which is a particularly uh, severe problem uh, in western part of China. And then the third angle is uh, climate change. Coal consumption contributes to close to 80% of the CO2 emissions in Chinese uh, energy sector. Um, so what I intend to do uh, today, hopefully in the, in, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, uh, is to uh, firstly give you guys uh, some quick overview of China's environmental law, our general impression of it, uh, and then dive into the air pollution law uh, specifically. After that, just offer some quick update in terms of what is really going on um, on China uh, in, terms of air uh, in terms of air quality and coal consumption, some of the latest statistics, and then just uh, conclude with some fortune-telling uh, points. Um, environmental law in China, um, I think uh, there are quite some challenges there. Um, it's, um, I think first and foremost, uh, Chinese environmental law is not written in a way that you can easily operationalize. What that means is if you read every single provision of the law, I think you would in general tend to agree with everything. But it's hard for you to ponder through what you can actually make use of it. So it's not written in a way, uh, it's, it's, it's more written in a, in a, in a way that it's like a, a political statement as opposed to uh, you know, a tool that you can uh, effectively utilize. Um, the other point is uh, the law normally is quite administratively oriented, meaning that, uh, you know, um, the administration or the government is put uh, in the central spot of both implementing um, and supervise the law, um, which leaves pretty limited space for other uh, wider range of stakeholders. And that's linked to the third point, which is lack of public uh, 
uh, participation. We've seen some improvement over the past uh, two or three years, but still, uh, I think we have a, a quite a long way to go. And then fourth point, I think, uh, will be a very familiar with all of you guys' uh, enforcement. That's a big problem uh, in China in terms of law in general. So um, the topic of today's uh, discussion is the new weapon uh, against uh, um, China's pollution. I would actually tend to put a question mark um, on whether um, China's environmental law is uh, the primary weapon that uh, you should put uh, in your ar arsenal. I think uh, you know we still, again, we still have a long way to go on that front. To dive into air pollution law um, a little bit, some quick background information. Uh, this is a mandate from the um, 2000 uh, version. We've seen an expansion, a quite significant expansion of the law from seven chapters, 66, uh, 66 provisions to eight chapters, 129 provisions. So it's been beefed up uh, in, in a quite big way. Uh, there were three rounds of hearings uh, before the bill was adopted. Um, but unfortunately, uh, what we observed was uh, in general, the law, the bill was um, uh, being watered down uh, during or after uh, uh, every single of the readings. Um, I would like to also highlight, I guess, two, uh, I would call, mismatches uh, in, in throughout the whole process. One is, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, we had a, uh, something called the Air Pollution Action Plan, which was released by the State Council September 2013. Um, and that uh, policy, that paper actually contains uh, uh, quite a number of really strong, really useful provisions. Coal consumption control, for example, information disclosure. Um, in general, uh, some of those very strong provisions failed to make their way into the air pollution law. So you had a sort of a tricky situation where you had an earlier policy, which is stronger, but you had a later law, which is actually weaker than that. The other mismatch uh, is sort of the mother-child uh, situation, which is, again, uh, if you recall, we had the environmental protection law, which was passed last year in force January 1st this year. Uh, and that, also, th that law is also a quite robust uh, legislation. Uh, which contains, as Steve mentioned, quite a few useful uh, provisions. And they also failed um, to some extent to make into um, the air pollution law. So you had sort of a higher mother law, which is stronger, which was passed uh, earlier, and a, you know, a, a weaker um, law focusing on specific uh, sector, which is air pollution in this case. I think it is also worth asking the question, what would be the implication for other sectorial legislations? For example, water pollution or soil pollution. Uh, is, is the air law setting the bar or precedence for other uh, sectorial laws? Mm -hmm. So what are the good and bad um, provisions in, the, in, in this piece? Just to uh, try to uh, pick some of the things up here. Uh, I think on, on, on the good side, a uh, pretty robust punishment system. That was sort of a one weak point in China's environmental law. What would be the consequence for non-compliance? Um, it's often too cheap to pollute than uh, to be uh, uh, you know, in line with the law. So that was uh, improved quite a bit. Um, we also saw two separated chapters, one for regional cooperation, as Steve mentioned already, one for emerging, uh, uh, emergence uh, mechanism which is, you know, once you have, you know, a very bad air uh, pollution day, what the public, what the government should do. So we have now two separated chapters um, being dedicated to these two issues. Um, on the not so good si uh, side, um, I think there is a discussion in terms of quantity versus quality. Uh, what this means is what um, is the ultimate objective of this law? Is that um, is, is, is the ultimate mandate of the law trying to uh, control the absolute amount of pollutants you put into the air, or is that trying to actually improve the overall air quality? Uh, in our view, it's definitely the latter that should be prioritized, but that's not entirely reflected into the law. Hmm. Coal cap was deleted um, after the first reading, uh, so I think that's uh, quite an unfortunate situation because, uh, again, coal consumption contributes to uh, about half of China's PM 2.5. Um, but let me, let me just uh, um, 
venture out to the real world a little bit. This chart shows you Beijing's PM 2.5 reading first half of this year compared to uh, the previous two years. So you can see the red line indicating this year is in general lower than the past two years. So Beijing's air pollution, Beijing's PM 2.5 at least, is improving this year. Uh, if we plug in uh, July and August data, I think you will basically suggesting the same thing. Um, it's getting better. And this is not only a Beijing issue. Across the country, this map shows you uh, the improvement or deterioration um, of different uh, places in China. Um, the um, darker, the, the, the blue circles shows you where um, PM 2.5 rating is getting down. The red dots shows you where it is getting worse. So in general, it is improving. Hmm. And it is improving quite a bit, 16% for the first half of this year. Uh, on a year-on-year -year basis compared to last year. Uh, Beijing, pretty much the same story, close to 16% improvement from 92 to 77. Um, but I would say we are, in general, winning a few battles, but not the war. Um, we are seeing, for, for example, Shanghai's PM 2.5 shooting up, actually. Uh, we are also having a, little bit, uh, a few new upper centers, places that you would not traditionally associate with, you know, particular wars of uh, air pollution, which is sort of another way to say Hebei. Um, <laughs> so Henan and uh, Hubei are ranked number two and four, respectively, in terms of wars air pollution. So increasingly, you are having sort of a, a, you know, a few provinces in the central part of the country uh, that is uh, 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 facing quite severe air pollution. And I think we need to bear in mind that 80% of all the Chinese cities are still far from meeting the national standard, which is 35, which is actually higher than the WHO recommended standard. Um, so what is reason of uh, the general improvement of PM 2.5 so far this year? Um, this chart shows you the energy consumption situation uh, all the way from 2000 to April this year. We are seeing a coal consumption decline starting from last year uh, by 2.9 percent. Uh, we are seeing continuous coal consumption decline this year as well. So by the, end of the this, uh, by the end of this year, I think it is very likely that you will see China's coal consumption uh, being reduced two years in a row. And that carries huge implication both on the air pollution front and also on climate change. Mm -hmm. I, I guess another way, another interesting way of looking at this is if you zoom in to the power sector, um, this one shows you the additional electricity demand in China in 2014 compared to the year before. And the bottom line story here is the additional demand was more than met by non-coal sources, which means we don't need burn any more coal just to meet our additional electricity demand. As you can see, it is primarily met by hydro, but also contributed by wind, solar, nuclear, and gas. And coal is actually declining uh, in this sector. I'm gonna skip this, but just offer some crystal ball um, remarks. Um, I think where we are so far is that um, uh, we've seen incremental PM 2.5 improvement on um, this year. And this is largely driven by China's economic restructuring and decline of coal use. Um, but it is a question on how far this can carry us forward. Is this sustainable or not? In our view, ultimately, environmental governance need to catch up. You cannot only rely on the economic you know, downturn to improve, to clean up the air. Um, and if you put China's environmental governance into, let's say, a 10 to 15 year time frame, we sort of had the last decade from 2000 to 2010. Um, and uh, it is picking up in a quite significant way, both in terms of public and policy awareness around 2010, especially in the air pollution discussion. And that was coupled with the ongoing economic restructuring, and which is what led us to where we are now. Um, but I, again, in terms of economic slowdown, um, or economic restructuring, I think it, 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 it is showing us that it can bring PM 2.5 probably from 80 to 70. 
But I would put a question mark on whether it can carry us further down from 70 to 35 or even lower, which is where we need to be. So I think to have a sustainable long-term um, you know, effective environmental governance system, we need much more weapons in the arsenal, which include the air pollution law, but, uh, you know, but also other things as well. So I will leave it here and, uh, and look forward to uh, the following discussions. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> and I think that RP is going to pass. It, see, I planned this perfectly. I invite people. No, the, the, I think we're going to see some. You guys the toughest job. Yep, he's got the toughest job. You have to. Okay. Go Thank beyond you. crystal ball. Yeah. Great, no problem. So um, I'm going to step back a little bit. So not just talk about the you know environment, um, air pollution control law, but just talk a little bit more about climate policies and not only talking about what's in the law. Uh, that's um, well, we, that's something related to the presentation I'm going to to give but more about how the climate policy has been doing in the past. And then with that eye, maybe we can shed some light on what this, you know, new, uh, this new law would do and how, how, what would turn out at the end. Uh, we're also going to identify a few actions to watch in the next five-year plan. Uh, I think that actually equals pretty well from what Lisha just said. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a report that you know, today's presentation is all based on our research that we uh, co-authored with the Tsinghua, Brooklyn Tsinghua um, Center. And this report is not published yet, so, uh, but it's going to be published later this month. Um, first of all, what are the climate policy performance? Uh, we actually went into, uh, you know, we, we, we review all the, you know, all the policies, you know, as on the book. And then we're also trying to do that, okay, what's happening, you know, on the ground, and trying to, get to have these answers that, you know, how are they doing? The over, uh, overarching message, I think, is pretty positive. It's like China's current policy is entering a new era of action. So we can see unprecedented shift from stating, statement of priorities. Um, you know, that's what China do all the time, you know, just like the uh, air pollution law as well. A uh, very lengthy but very articulated statement of priorities. But not only that, the climate action actually shift on from statement of priority to concrete actions and targets that actually we see that producing results. And we believe that it's because um, the highest level of government actually starting to see the benefit of climate action um, from environment perspective, from the economic perspective, from job perspective. And that actually, you know, that act we can shift, see the shift not only from the, you know, statement of, on climate or environment issues, but from the ideology, uh, you know, narrative of the, of the party. And also that we see that evidence that this is not only about propaganda, it's not about saying, saying it's going to happen, but actually we see that a persistent effort to push out this, uh, this idea through different level of uh, government. And as a result, we see that uh, you know, this is uh, from the uh, very clear patent that um, you know, from the high level international pledge then translating to you know, domestic enforceable targets that will have a legal meaning in the Chinese context, and then specific uh, you know, strategies and plans that actually sustain the their achievement of these targets. So I think that's uh, been working pretty well overall, as it sees that really clear that how these uh, different components are all linked. It shows that how the international projects are being translated into the domestic uh, you know, targets, and then how different uh, specific policy strategies and profit plans are being able to connect it, and then how this actually enable the government of China to make broader and more ambitious uh, you know, commitment over time. This is uh, our assessment uh, st you know, uh, projects that China is going to meet and actually exceeds most of these climate energy targets made in the 12 five year plan. Um, you know, the most prominent one is the climate energy ones, uh, you know, the carbon intensity and climate intensity targets. Um, uh, but also other targets like the renew uh, like the non fossil energy mix, you know, you know, as a proportion to, to the total energy mix, the forest coverage I think uh, they probably are going to miss the total energy consumption target, uh, but that's not our, you know, abiding target per se. But uh, overall picture is that they're meeting their targets. So the next question is like, okay, they're meeting the targets. Is that just because that the economy, right, just said that, or it's just because that they actually um, 
doing the enforcement of the policies which is at work. Well, we are not ruling out that the economy has a big role in this. I think that's the fundamental, uh, that's actually how the policies affect change at, at the end. But we also uh, actually go into four different case studies. Um, um, maybe just a little bit here. So we also go into uh, four case studies in four specific you know, legal instruments or policy instruments. That is not only about broad statements, but have really detailed implementation schemes, fundings, uh, you know, enforcement, uh, enforcement compliance mechanisms, and see how these policy instruments work. And our conclusion is that overall they are, they are being implemented as a design. There are strong evidence that showing, uh, you know, attributing the results to this uh, uh, to these policies and uh, in the implementations. Uh, of course, as any other country, so China has its challenges in implementing these uh, policy instruments and there's uh, things that can be done better. Uh, but there's, uh, the or, it, overall, the message is pretty clear that you know, these p policies instruments are being treated seriously, uh, although without, it's not without flaw, but uh, overall it's doing very really good. And another uh, issue is that there is not about just different policies that we see the, a comprehensive emerging of policy framework uh, on climate energy issues. So this is look too, too, too hard to read, but don't bother to do it. Just give you a sense that there's you know, different sectors and different uh, ministry of uh, agencies and trying to take actions on mitigation, on the, uh, on the both mitigation and adaptation side and adaptation side. So this very comprehensive diff different sectors in the energy sector, in building sector, in transportation sector, uh, in, in core sectors. So they're trying to do this in a, in a more comprehensive way. And what we comes out from this emerging uh, policy framework, what are the key features? One is that they have you know, very, very concrete and you know, quantified targets uh, on energy and climate issues. Um, that's pretty uh, unique to the Chinese uh, situation. Um, the, it's pretty clear defined responsibilities, you know, different ministries, they're not perfect, but they're, uh, they're still, uh, you know, comparatively speaking, quite well defined that uh, which thing is going to do what in which sector. So you will be able to do it more in a more accountable way. So if you're missing a target, into, for example, in the transportation sector or the building sector, you know which uh, you know, ministries to be, to, be, to be responsible for. And you know, data issues, I think this is very really sensitive and very really, uh, controversial issues in China. And, but we see very really concrete evidence that Chinese government actually is trying to ramp up its data infrastructure in the past, uh, uh, past few years. And you know, trying to explore more of the market mechanisms. Finally, that this non, not only about uh, mitigation, it's still heavily focused on mi mitigation, uh, but still uh, paying more increased attention to adaptation. So what are the key policies to watch going forward? Um, here is our three things. The one thing I think everybody mentioned earlier, you know, energy and coal cap, consumption cap. Um, so the things to watch in the next five year, re next five year plan, uh, which is going to be approved next, early next year, uh, is whether this actually will be a, you know, will in the five year plan. Is it, if it is, is it a national level master five year plan? Or it will just, or the local one. Is it going to be disaggregated in, you know, incorporating the local five-year plan, which give it more teeth and more accountabilities? Um, you know, in the the thing about the targets in five-year plan in Chinese context, there's two kind of targets. One target is kind of called binding targets, which the government are supposed to be using administrative means, you know, to attain, you know, to achieve the target, the attainment. The other, the other target is called expected target, where the government is, you know, supposed to manipulate secondary uh, you know, it, uh, forces like economy, like enable environment that to enable to meeting of those targets. So the expected market, expected market usually is, is diff more difficult to, to achieve at a precise, you know, because it's, you know, it's more far away from the intervention. So whether this target is going to be expected target or binding target, it has very implications. And what are the levels? Um, of course, right? Otherwise it doesn't make any sense. The second thing to watch in the uh, next five year plan is you know, the CO2 growth cap. Uh, whether there will be a growth cap there. Again, um, whether, if there's a, there's, a, there's a CO2 growth cap that is going to be a national level cap 
or it's going to be disaggregated into the national level, uh, in the lo local level or sector level. I think that's also very key, uh, important. Is it what's the what's the nature of the of, of the cap? Is the binding expected, and what are the levels? Uh, so this also the um, another very important um, you know issue to watch for. So finally, that we all know that China is trying to roll out its emission trading and putting a price on carbon. So these are very different, you know, there's a lot of building blocks that need to be filled out and whether China can actually overcome all these technical and political barriers, you know, for example, al allocating that emission allowance and then disaggregating to different, uh, and, you know, province or even enterprises and whether they can do it on time in a robust space, that is something to watch for. So three things to watch for in the next five year plan, and all of, all of these three actions, China actually, there's a debate going on. Um, there's all under government consideration, and they are all very possible to happen, but we don't know for sure. So that's uh, really important to, to, to watch. What are the challenges? What, um, so one key thing from, from reviewing the, what's happening, is that we, you know, China actually is learning from doing, just like any other countries, nothing is perfect. Um, so doing, you know, learning from its past and learning from others that, you know, achieving uh, better, doing these things better will be very important. Um, it further enhances uh, transparency and data accuracy. Um, we already see a really concrete effort from the government to build up the data infrastructure. Um, so the next step is to giving more specific, uh, being more specific there, have more stringent, uh, you know, more stringent requirement on the data transparency and uh, data accuracy. Um, strengthen the uh, policy, you know, enforcement and compliance mechanisms. Um, just like like Shaw just uh, said that, right? There's a law there, and then it doesn't make sense if you don't need comply and enforce them. And you know, our review shows that in general the policy are being implemented and enforced, but they can do better. There's 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 room for improvement. Um, so in some areas, such as carbon, uh, carbon capture and, uh, and other reduction opportunities, such as, for example, non-CO2 greenhouse gas uh, reduction, that there's a, they are still in a more priority or statement of priority stage rather than concrete policy stage. So in these areas, the more concrete policy and you know, uh, actions will be very, very helpful and useful. And then improve policy coordination. So um, as climate change actually environment uh, and air pollution is a core sector issues. So improved coordinations uh, between the different uh, environment and climate energy policies, but also, you know, beyond that, you know, in the urbanization policies and then making sure that the ministries are talking to each other and come up with a more coordinated policies, extremely important and going on. And finally, um, no, well, the innovation of policy making. So some of the policies are quite, quite Chinese, uh, you, know, you know, quite quite unique to China. Uh, um, you know, for, for example, the one of the policy we review is that this target disaggregation. You know, you, the, the government set a target and it disaggregated to different uh, provinces, and then provinces disaggregate the energy saving target to the enterprises, using mainly the administrative means. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, uh, we see that there's actually limit to further using that kind of that kind of policies and, and approach. So more innovation, you know, more incentive, more market-oriented driven policy will be very helpful and to, f to further to, uh, to, the, to the next level. And finally, that whether these policies are actually working or being implemented, we are doing this as an independent study. The government should take up this role and then, you know, have a more um, comprehensive tracking system on, you know, not only about the broad targets, but about specific policies, instruments, whether they're working, how they implement it, what are the impact, specific impacts and quantify assessments. Such a system is very, will be very helpful to inform their decision making going forward. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Li Shui, you got to get back here because someone may have a question for you. Wow. I mean, these guys, your presentations, I think they were, they wove together really nicely. I have some kind of questions, but I kind of, I want to make sure this audience, it's, it's a part of the afternoon, the blood sugar is getting low. Want to get them alive? I'll interject my questions. Ruth, greens my belt. Grab, grab a microphone. I knew you Hi. have a question, Ruth. Uh, say who you are. <laughs> say who you are. I know you, but yeah. maybe the audience okay. doesn't. Yeah, I'm Ruth Greenspan Bell here at the Wilson Center. Um, I just have a more fundamental question, which I, the second speaker kind of, you know, slightly touched on it. Um, 
We know that China is not historically a country that's been governed by laws. It's still working out a lot of complex issues in terms of um, commercial and financial regularity and stuff. So why do we keep insisting that China use laws, keep drafting laws, and keep insisting on things like using emissions trading, which, I mean, I, I won't go on at length, but I can, you know, I, there's some substantial problems with that. Why aren't we encouraging China to look to its own governance traditions to handle these problems. We don't have the time for it to make that kind of change. So I'm really kind of interested in your reaction. I just want to remind that there were massive law drafting efforts in the early 90s. The Asian Development Bank funded uh, Dick Stewart at NYU and a bunch of other people, and they wrote a water law and some other laws. Um, and I haven't seen that those have had a big impact. So I would love to hear sort of, you know, digging a little deeper on whether this is, you know, a fool's errand or whether this is really worth doing. Okay. Do you want to start off? And it's all, it's always on. So. Oh, okay. Cool. Sure. Uh, I think I, I think that's a, that's a really difficult but really good question. Um, I mean, I, I think I can say a few things. One is uh, as long as the law is just uh, a piece of paper, in the, in the air pollution law case, 33 pager, I think. As long as it is as static as that, it's not going to make a big difference in the near term, at least. But I think that the key thing here is you need to create an environment which is dynamic, which actually li let different stakeholders to interact with this piece of paper. As long as you don't do that, then you will not achieve the objective that you are trying to achieve. So I think, I think that's the one thing. Um, uh, one example, one case in point that I can give you is, um, I think the, on the, on the I mean, we, we cover both the climate side of the thing, CO2, GHG, and also environment, air pollution, and water pollution. Uh, I, I think it's worth studying the climate side of things very, very carefully. I think in terms of governance, they are much more advanced than the environmental side for the precise reason that there is a very dedicated, very smart strategic effort to create such an ecosystem where different forces interact with, with each other and moving things forward. Whereas you don't see that, uh, at least not as dynamic as that in water, soil, air pollution, I think um, to some extent contributed by the public awareness. I think it is much more dynamic than a few years ago. I mean, to kind of supplement that, that, that you're saying, because I, I was going to make the same kind of comment, you know, because you, RP, you had that slide about, you know, all of, both of you talked about how in the climate side and energy, it's a much more comprehensive ecosystem for laws. I mean, it's got, they've got, they have it in the plan, they have it in the law, they have, you know, campaigns, and even some of the public participation, you know, I mean, well, not as much on the public participation, but that, and I've, and I've been saying for a number of years, that's like, gee, if only the water sector could be, if water could be looked at more comprehensively. And, and so one question, but, but it kind of begs the question, can, you know, can, you know, can for air and water, can they really learn from this? I mean, I think that, I mean, energy, energy is just seen as so vital by, I mean, I mean, the climate legislation policies is led by N NDRC, right? Mm -hmm. And they're powerful. Ministry of Environmental Protection, not so powerful. Well, I mean, I, I do think so. I mean, I, I, I do think they can replicate some of the lessons there. Um, I mean, I think in general, uh, you see a very different environmental debate or discussion in China uh, this time around than 10 years ago. It's much more diverse, much more noisy, mm -hmm. uh, which are the very valuable elements, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, different people can utilize and take take advantage of. Uh, so I, I see them emerging trend. I mean, I, I would agree in general it's not yet there. Yeah. Um, it's not, you know, as sexy and well connected as climate or energy issue in, in particular. But I, I, I see some room to uh, to move around. Uh, but, but let me just say another point, which is uh, connect to your question, why do we just, uh, you know, use uh, more Chinese, more traditional Chinese? But we are using it. I mean, uh, target setting, right? I mean, that's, that's very, very effective. But again, that's not going to take you from 80 to 30, single-handedly. That's, that's not enough. You need sort of a comprehensive package to 
who achieve that. And I want to make sure everyone understands when you say 80 to 30, you're uh, referring PM to the 5. PM 2.5. Yeah, that's sure. sort of my benchmark now. Um, but you know, 80 to 30 by yeah, 20. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, but you, you got the idea. That applies to water, to soil, to other things as well. Yeah. RP, did, uh, I, mean, yeah, I think I, we can go down I, the line yeah, here. Yeah, I think he said just what I want to say. I mean, one thing is that he said, you know, the, this traditional uh, Chinese method to, to handle things is dynamic, it's not static. So things are changing now. I think there's a more increasing uh, willingness, at least, at least the, the trying to do more in the more legal and more public and transparent way. Um, that was evidence in our review that they're trying to do it, at least in the environment space, uh, environment kind of energy space, that they're trying to do that, um, you know. Yes, and I, I agree totally that, you know, more so far, it's more effective and more most of the um, result may attribute to the more administrative means that those standards and just, you know, closure of, you know, uh, obsolete capacity. Um, but we also found that, you know, in because of the end process nowadays in China is different from 10 years ago. They're challenging that, why are you asking us with our legal basis? Um, you know, for emission treatings, you know, some of them, um, you know, some of the international enterprises will get involved and the regulator, they were asking that, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the rationale behind this? Why there's no public consultation? They're asking these kind of questions and making it difficult to single, single you know, handedly to rely on administrative, uh, you know, approach. On, on the other hand, we also see that, as I said, there's limited potential. I think there's a lot of low-hanging food that's very really easy to identify, you know, as a bureaucrat, that are being picked. And the rest of the potentials, they are pretty subtle, and there's, you have to be on the front line of the business to be realizing that. And a bureaucrat, you know, official in the government is not the best people to, to identify them. The best way to do it is to set, target, you know, set up mechanisms and incentivize people to do it. I think that also shows that the Chinese economy involvement, right, um, resolve you know after, in over a couple of years from more, you know, from more more, think, more easy to understand to a much more complex entity as it is now. Okay, and how about Steve, the lawyer on the table here? Well, what do you yeah, think? I mean, they, I think they, why are they doing all these laws? We're talking about the law because they just passed it, and <laughs> they they came in and passed it on a Saturday. So apparently, in China, they think it's pretty important. Uh, but I, I don't think it's either <laughs> or, right? I mean, I mean, Ruth's right. The 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 thing, the thing. What what really matters is the bottom line and reducing the pollution, and how you get from eighty to thirty to thirty. Um, you know, part of the issue is you need to get at a lot more sources in order to get down to thirty, and maybe law uh, might offer some effective tools for doing that. Uh, but that doesn't mean you know that anybody is advocating for those tools to the exclusion of other tools, if yeah. there are other tools that are useful as well. Okay, good. Some other questions out here. Okay, we'll do Steve. We'll do these two right in a row. Come on down, Joyce. You must speak in the mic because we are webcast. Hi, thank you. I'm Steve Mills with the Climate Reality Project. I guess my question to you is, in the context of enforcement and implementation, if you could speak to the opportunities for public engagement and public participation, particularly as it relates to these new NGO laws governing the operations of NGOs, and what what do you see changing, improving, uh, weakening? Um, clearly, here uh, public engagement is important to enforcement, uh, blowing the whistle, and so forth. Can you talk about that a bit? Yep. And let's take one more question so we can ping pong between two. Um, Jing Jing Liu from Columbia Law School. So my question is somewhat related to uh, what Jennifer just said in terms of the uh, um, the power well, the authority of the Ministry of Environmental Protection and their local counterparts. Um, as you all know, the weak authority of Ministry of Environmental Protection at the central level and their local counterparts have long been uh, considered a reason for poor implementation of environmental law in China. So I just wonder the, whether this air, new air pollution prevention and control law help in certain degrees strengthen the authority of the environmental protection agencies. Because this law, um, in many provisions, requires coordination of MEP with other very powerful um, agencies, um, whether it's um, fuel standard or vehicle emission or poor uh, uh, pollution. So I just wonder whether you see there's um, the Ministry of Environmental Protection is getting uh, uh, more power um, from this new law. I also have a question um, on the INDC. Can I ask it now? Can your brains well, hold it, gentlemen? 
Yeah. One more yeah. question. All right, they can do three, and after that we got. Okay, so that's what they do. <laughs> yeah, I just want to get uh, Li Shu and Ran Ping's take on um, on the target um, submitted by China at the INDC because there's been a lot of controversy about the target. Um, some people say it's a very realistic or even reasonably aggressive target. Other people saying it's low ball, it's very conservative, and China's emission is likely to peak um, by 2025 instead of 2030, or even earlier than 2025. So I just want to get a take from the ex climate experts in terms, what do you think uh, about the targets? Thank you. And just in case not everyone in the room is a climate expert, what's INDS stand for so they know? INDC, yeah. INDC. In internet, uh, international Determined Contribution. Thank you. Because again, not everyone knows. Right? <laughs> All right, so who wants to start? So we had Steve, opportunity for public engagement. Question? MEP and INDC. Who wants to start? Steve? Uh, you yeah, pick whatever you on want. On the public participation in NGOs, I think, yeah, I, I, I briefly mentioned uh, this, but, but it, this is such an important area. Um, uh, so the, the pollution map apps, I think, are an incredibly important development. Uh, and when you when you hear a speech from a Chinese local official these days, at least when I'm there, usually they'll say they'll pull out their phone and they'll say the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I check the air quality. Um, but it's not just the uh, that the officials are checking it; it's that people uh, all over the country are checking it and paying attention to this. And I think um, I guess it's just an illustration that that kind of sunshine approach of making the information public, requiring the polluting sources to make the information public may be one of the most effective things out there. And we didn't talk about this much, but there's this requirement that uh, supposedly the 15,000 biggest polluting sources are now going to have to publicly disclose their emissions. I think that kind of information, when you can, when you can tell where the pollution is coming from, can be incredibly significant. In the U.S., we saw big reductions in pollution when we started to require um, that kind of information be publicly disclosed is in an easily accessible way. Even companies that were already complying with the requirements that applied to them, they still did things to bring their numbers down because they didn't want to stick out as the biggest polluter in the community, even where they were polluting at legal, legal levels. The other piece on NGOs, of course, uh, that I'd mention is the uh, uh, Environmental Public Interest Litigation Provision, which was in the framework environmental law amendments last year, but not picked up in the air law. Um, there is, uh, I think there is at least one air case pending um, under that law, and there's about 20 cases across the country that are pending uh, now, and one of them has already gone to trial. So I think we're, we're, you know, we're, we're keeping, I think that's something a lot of people are watching, is to see whether allowing social organizations to bring cases directly against polluters is going to make a difference and going to sort of uh, light a fire under the, uh, the, under the polluters to comply with the requirements. Yeah, and you can, I mean, don't want to forget, since, since we're talking law here, that, you know, I mean, well, it wasn't a law, but like in 2008, there was the open government information measures that were issued, and MEPA issued their own. And so, you know, basically a Freedom of Information Act for environment. I got my OGI expert in the back, so I'm going to be very careful as I talk. Our new scholar, hi, Jamie. <laughs> she can correct me. But, but I mean, but that... that it doesn't happen overnight that suddenly, bam, you've got open information. And, and, but, so, but it's kind of like the, the, the tiny little fire was lit, and that, that was seven years ago. And so that, that's why, so those of you who are maybe not you know, deeply ensconced into what's happening you know, for open information in China, so that the conversation, it's been coming forward, but it is kind of a, you know, whether or not, you know, what, where it's going to go from here. I don't have my crystal ball. Sir. So um, the transparency, I think the, you know, for the, for the, for the policy instruments that we, re we revealed, that you know, it's very interesting to see that you know, there's various degree, even for the emission trading pilots, for example, that there various degree of transparency. You know, some 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 pilots are doing pretty good, some some of them are much less. You know, for example, that you know, uh, what are the uh, specific uh, rules to allocate uh, allowance? Uh, what are the specific uh, you know uh, regulations? How transparent they are? You know, in different pilots, they're doing pretty quite differently. But hopefully that we can see that you know they're they bring together and then we can see a pathway of learning from there, and you know of course I agree that uh, in general that transparency is a is an area that we need to be improved. Um, one case in point is say you know specific emissions you know greenhouse gas emissions for specific country uh, entities or companies are kept 
confidential to the public in China, right, which is not not so in you know in in the US in you uh, in de developed world. So that kind of transparency, I think, that will actually help to you know to to provide more activity for more engagement because you it's very difficult to engage if you don't have a transparent open uh, data. And we are seeing the improvement of that. We, at least that you know from no data, no infrastructure, from uh, to for now that they're building the foundation to create uh, to collect data, building our safeguard to to make sure the data is uh, more accurate, uh, less uncertain, and then hopefully, um, you know, sometime in the future that can make it more transparent and, um, you know, can enable public discussion on the policy implementations and, uh, and compliance. Um, for China's INDC, that's a very interesting target, and actually we also working with Tsinghua and NCSC, the, uh, I don't know NCSC's full name, but just in our organization, <laughs> another think nobody, tank nobody knows. Uh, no, in China, uh, you know, with which associated with the Chinese government um, to see that what other, uh, you know, China's ground gas emission trends and mitigation potentials. And then, you know, very, very interesting finding that I think we conclude that, first of all, that China's INDC require extra effort. It's not a BAU scenario. I think not a reference, scenario, not a reference case scenario. That definitely need to be extra effort. That's not easy uh, to, to, be, to be achieved by the on the government time, it will not just happen. There's actually pretty effort going on. The thing I think is that um, there's very large uh, you know, range of uncertainty about what are the mitigation potential. You know, there's a variety of uh, studies uh, showing a very large you know, range of you know, what would the mitigation potential would look like. So it's very hard to judge from there. Um, but what's, what seems to, to be emerged pretty commonly is to say, Let's don't forget about we are talking about greenhouse gas emissions. Talking about you know, trying to avoid uh, global warming of uh, you know more than two degree. Then the most important question is say what are the uh, cumulative emissions and the timing of the of the peaking may not be so important as far as if you can decline pretty quickly after the peak. So uh, all the scenario, although they have different ideas about uh, when we peak, but they seem to be at least some, many of them seem to suggest that between 2020 and 2030 uh, would be a slow rate of growth. So even that it's not peak, but the, the, the increase rate will be pretty slow. So, you know, don't be fixated about which year to pick, but rather than talking more about the policy that will really enable it to be, you know, declined afterwards. And then I think that's a more helpful and constructive way to, to think about this discussion. You've been strangely quiet there. Lee. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'm just reserving my energy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I guess just to start from INDC, um, um, I think that's, uh, you know, in, I, 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 I would agree with, uh, with Jinping's uh, observation. Um, I think, uh, you know, the way that we see it is uh, that's the floor of, uh, of action. Uh, it's certainly not, not enough, uh, especially from a climate change point of view, from an air pollution point of view as well because uh, they, they all come from the same sources, coal combustion. Mm. Um, but let me, let me maybe just to add um, one thing, which is, um, you know, um, I think the, the, the whole thing is quite interesting, uh, you know, given the fact, w w uh, given the timing of the INDC submission, which uh, is earlier this year, um, June this year. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at the external, the, the, you know, the real world, China's coal consumption declined last year. So it just happened to be in a very interesting conjunction where I think it's getting clearer and clearer that China's energy, con uh, energy system is witnessing a fundamental change. And that fundamental change happened just to be so close to the NDC submission so that it's difficult for you to factor in that. And there will be discussions as well in terms of how sustainable this coal, de uh, coal decline is. Um, it's hard uh, if you are a policymaker to, you know, just based on one year's experience to project 15 years into the future. But I think it, nevertheless, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, sort of the sequencing and the timing of the event, uh, which uh, I think is, is important to, uh, to bear in mind. Um, the other thing is also um, we are um, negotiating the Paris Agreement uh, these days. Uh, 
you will have a very good picture uh, early November. Um, there is a synthesis paper being prepared by the UNFCCC Secretariat, which will tell you basically, um, you know, the collective efforts, all the INDCs adding together will not help us stay below two degrees. That's very clear already at the moment. Um, the question is then, what do you do? And that's largely the job of the Paris process. You need a living, not a static, a living dynamic system to be able to enhance and ramp up ambition over time. Um, you know, the ambition that you can't find at this point of time, but you may be able to have them and backload them into the system. So I think that's what we're trying to do uh, there uh, in relation to Paris. And also just to realize uh, everybody is doing this 15 years in, in, in advance, for some countries 10 years in advance, you know, which, which is not an easy, exer uh, easy exercise. Nobody have really the crystal ball. Um, so I think everybody tend to uh, you know, uh, keep the largest card uh, probably a little bit close to their chest at the moment. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of how we're talking today is very, you know, talking a lot about top-down stuff. And, and I was kind of curious with, like, in, in the air law that, you know, that I think Steve mentioned that was also in the environmental protection law, the idea that, that there are provisions that if you, if you have exceeded the air pollution limits, that construction funds are going to be held back. Has this, has this happened yet? Can has I, anyone held? Yeah, anyone. I'm not I mean, I mean, that's the thing. Is like, it's the same thing like certain officials will lose their job if they don't meet the targets. Has that happened yet? I mean, I, I, I think you are pushing the right button. I think you have a, an audience. Because <laughs> I'm <also> naughty. <laughs> always pushing the right button. Again, this, I think this comes back to the, the general impression of environmental law in China, which is how do you actually operationalize which is when you read one provision saying, you know, someone need to be punished if there is non-compliance, right? I mean, you would agree with that. But how do you, what does that mean? Who is doing the punishment? To what extent? It doesn't say. Um, so that's, I think that's the problem for the moment. But you kind of wonder, like, cause, but then we also hear these examples, I mean, sometimes it's been around water where, the local community where they get angry about polluted water and they try to make the mayor drink something. And so there's this, and then Beijing rushes in, oh, you know, you know that this kind of case by case, like when the, when the people or some way there's, some, or there's an accident that makes a lot of noise, it, it, it's very reactive in terms of, but, I'm, but now, now to be on the positive side though, I mean, have you, do you have examples, it could be from climate as well, where, where cities or provinces are actually being innovators and, and, and trying things. I mean, there's, it's not all just top down. I mean, have you, I mean, we're talking so much more about how cities, it's, it's the level everyone's operating at. Do you, got some, do you have some examples? Sure. Well, I mean, if I may, just uh, I guess this is, again, from the climate uh, side of the things. I mean, uh, we have something called the ETS. As Ramping mentioned, there are seven pil pilots, all sub-national um, you know, level uh, authorities, some of them provincial, some of them uh, municipality. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's been... Uh, a very useful exercise so far, uh, not in terms of uh, slashing CO2 emission uh, in absolute term, at least during, I mean, uh, over the short term, but uh, it is quite useful in terms of building up the capacity in um, the local cities and provinces. I mean, one, one straightforward example that I always give is, uh, you know, I have, if I need to talk about climate change in the context of Beijing or Hubei or Guangdong, who should I call or email? Five years ago, <laughs> I don't I don't have any focal point, right? Mm -hmm. But throughout the exercise of building up the ETS, now you have at least an office of two, five, or ten, even ten people sitting there actually working on this issue. In, so, are they are they at the the mayor's office level? These well, I mean, it, it depends. Some of them handle things in you know the environmental exchanges, mm -hmm. right? Or a lot of universities are involved. But I think they are driving the agenda, which is quite different from year, you know, a few years ago. And they are actually exploring, they have the room to explore different approaches. You, you see those uh, seven pilots innovating, trying to develop their own niche or own edge. So I think that's, that's quite useful. That's sort of, uh, you know, I think the very essence of piloting uh, of emission trading in those places is exactly to try to let them navigate the water you know, fail and learn from experience. 
Mm -hmm. And they are quite proactive. They are quite, you know, uh, um, going out there and then explore different options. So I, I, I think that's one, one, one way. Again, you need to design a system that actually is dynamic, that actually let people do things, and then they can feed those back onto the central level. So as long as, as you have that kind of an ecosystem, then uh, you can move things yeah. forward. But there are, and, and you know, we will be having more meetings looking at the city level because you've, you've been really seeing like in NRDC and well, WRI has done it in the past, where you have organizations, even the US EPA, DOE, engaging the city level in China. We're talking, working with MOHERD. MOHERD, you guys know that acronym? You guys are so cute. <laughs> Come on, there's a quiz here, you all have failed. The Ministry of Housing and Urban and Rural Development, MOHERD. It's like Health and Human Services here, but on steroids, because it covers rural as well. But that's an incredibly powerful ministry, and that they're being engaged a lot more on climate and pollution issues. And so that, that's something, too, that when, when, Steve, when you were talking about, well, who's going to enforce it? And, I, and part of my answer was thinking, like, well, MET can't, but MOHERD could, on some of these provisions. All right, I should let them ask questions. You, you, and he's so patient. He's like, if you don't give me the mic now. Thank you. Uh, and to say, say your name and brief, brief question. Well, I've got, a brief co I've got mostly a brief comment, but my name is Jed Schilling. I'm with Millennium Institute. We have a very deep partnership with ISTIC. That's the Institute for Science and Technology Information in China. And we have developed with them a very detailed system dynamic model. You needed to talk about needing dynamic approaches that integrates the economic, social, environmental factors in considerable detail on the basis of China's causal relations and data um, across a large number of sectors. And we've looked in a lot of detail about China meeting the CO2 emissions targets for 2020 and showed that the technical changes that were underway were not going to quite be able to make it, as you indicated, that the progress is not getting there and demonstrated why things like um, slowing the growth of the housing size, if you talk about your MOA. Urbanization. Yeah. That um, would have the benefit of reducing the demand for cement and steel, which would reduce CO2 emissions, less required over time for heating or air conditioning. And by slowing the uh, rate of urbanization, it also increased agricultural production compared to the base case. So because there was less land that was taken out of production. So it's a very useful and powerful tool, and it can incorporate a lot of these factors and generate longer-term scenarios, um, which you can't perfectly predict the future. But it's very good to show how these things will cost more in the short run, but produce these benefits over the long run. And it would also take account of things like increasing the hydropower might have positive or negative effects on food security and other things. So it's very important to take these things into account. So I will be happy to talk more about this in detail later. But my question is, to what extent is there scope for taking a more comprehensive and integrated approach by looking not just at the attempts to reduce CO2 emissions and the other pollution things, but with the broader effects that that would be on other sectors and how activities in other sectors may affect that, so, um, and to take the longer term view. So I'd be happy to have any comments about this, and as I say, we can discuss this later. There are a lot more modelers now in China doing stuff kind of like this. What, what, do, what are your thoughts? I think, um, I think that's a very good uh, comment. Uh, the need for, that's one of the why we said that there's need for better policy coordination, not only among this climate energy environment policies, but with broader policies, such as just urbanization policy, with transportation mm -hmm. policies, which is lacking so far. There's some mentioning. There was the you know you can see the philosophy of working is very there, but still is still in a very vague, yeah. um, not very clear, you know carefully thought out kind of fashion. Because in theory, is I th there was something I can't remember what it was called that was passed that said that that all planning is supposed to take climate change into account now, right? Yeah, that I mean, was just like a, so. So, a so that yeah. So that's what what we're seeing is <laughs> that you will see start to see some of their, um, you know, cost reference mm -hmm. from their these planning, but they're still at the priorities or statement level, rather than uh, you cannot quite figure out that how they actually incorporate that thinking into their overall strategy planning. Uh, with, a, with a few exceptions, um, I think the the China Climate Change Plan. Uh, actually um, incorporate their an, another 
policy is about uh, China's uh, the functional area plan. You know, how, you know different areas will have different functions. You know, some some industry, some urban, some you know, like reserved for ecological services. And then you can see really clear reference and you know the treatment for you know different things are allowed or not allowed in different regions and different according to their you know the what what function they're supposed to serve. So. I think that that's a really good positive development. Uh, I see that in one specific document and you know planning, uh, but that's so far I can I can I can put my fingers on on this one one, you know, they're getting there, but not not yet. Yeah. Okay. Some other questions. Yeah. So take we'll get these two ladies out here. And make sure you say your name and affiliation. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yue Zhang. Uh, I'm a fellow at the Wilson Center. New so fellow. Hi. New fellow. Yes. Oh. Hi. Uh, so I have a quick observation and uh, one uh, question. So the observation is, I don't know if any uh, of our speakers or you know, audiences sitting here, have you heard of this term, uh, APEC blue or military parade blue? You know, because when, when Beijing hosting those events, you know, the summit for APEC, and also recently, uh, the be beginning of this month, during the military parade, the sky was all of a sudden blue overnight because of you know, the government implemented a lot of control over people's activities. So uh, my question for the panel is, so what is, the, so what, what is your comment on, on phenomena like those? And, uh, and you know, how can uh, you know, we evaluate or, uh, you know, the, because I think the most important thing is whether the Chinese government put the environmental issue on top of the agenda. And we see there are occasions in which they do, and also in many other occasions they do not. So what is your comment uh, on, on, on this? And a more specific question for uh, Yan Ping is, uh, you mentioned the governance structure uh, in your talk, particularly uh, you mentioned under the, this new um, legal or policy framework, we begin to see more uh, collaboration between different ministries. Uh, it has become more comprehensive. So I just wonder, uh, how do they collaborate? What is the mechanism for different ministries to work with one another in dealing with the environmental issue? Thank you. Okay, why don't we take those two, her two questions. Sure, uh, yeah, I guess maybe I can start with, uh, uh, yeah, APEC <coughs> Blue. Um, I think the, the lesson that at least I draw from there uh, is that it again strengthened our understanding on the sources of mm -hmm. pollutants. Right, I mean, uh, they basically shut down, uh, you know, a lot of traffic, a lot of factories. So, and then uh, you see PM 2.5 decline. So, it's it's a quite useful exercise for you to uh, realize where does the emission come from. It also provides a pretty good reminder and benchmark on how things could be, uh, which I think is is quite important. Um, you know, uh, uh, to once in a while remind uh, the public. Um, about it, and I think I think uh, it 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 also I think sort of institutionalized a memory there uh, within the public, um, you know that they can actually refer to a good case <coughs> in point. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's actually quite significant. Um, I think you know in terms of environmental protection in the uh, overall let's say political agenda in China. Just one interesting observation, uh, which is uh, if you go back two years ago uh, when the administration uh, went into office uh, and you just check some, uh, some news around that time period, March two years ago, uh, you actually saw you know, that peak floating um, in the Huangpu River. You saw a sandstorm in Beijing, PM 2.5 shooting up as well. So I would actually argue that that sort of uh, is the probably the first thing that the administration need to address when they, you know, uh, firstly got into office. And, and I, wonder, I, I wonder that whether that leaves some institutional memory there as well. And I, I, again, I think it's good to put things into context. If you compare what we have now to 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I would say it is a quite big difference. Any others? Yeah. So, um, you know, f first of all, the, the, I think the APEC brew or, you know, the parade brew, they also, you know, help the public to refresh, right? It's every time that that brew freeze out that you all came, you know, all come back or this, you know, uh, haze. 
that you know the, we see that in social media people are crying out loud okay we, we should have this brew all the time so i think doing those things actually helpful in you know re building and rebuilding the political support for more strengthened um effort on, on or or just more i mean but but the fact that it goes back to the haze is yeah it actually actually, actually but reminds it keeps, yeah it reminds keeps you the pressure on the government because but that's is that why you know we did i mean the fact that you know like you know I, don't, I can't remember my 15 years at the Wilson Center when I've had so many new environmental laws passing. Like It's like dominoes. I mean, really. And that's, and I think it, you can link it to the, the, the air and, um, you know, maybe, you know, Chai Jing's film, which don't forget, you know, that, that Chai Jing, she produced the best primer on where, why we have air pollution in China. You know, it's just like the, the coal, the cars. And I felt like, oh, you know, we, we had uh, Ailun from Climate Works here, used to be at Greenpeace, who said, in all my years, I've been saying this, and no one listened. And she makes this short, <laughs> her short little you know, 90, one, one minute cartoon with the little P2, PM 2.5 ninjas, but she nailed it. And that's and that's and that actually is quite significant. I mean, do people still talk about the film in China? Which film? The uh, Chai Jing's Under yeah. the Dome. Yeah, I think I think the the, the memory is there. Is there is, still? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it's very 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 huge impression on on the ordinary people, mm -hmm. and about the uh. Priorities. I think that you can reflect it from. It's it's really difficult. It's a more quite intangible thing, right? You can you can make reservation observation along the, the actions, which I think that's the public that claim that is pretty top of their mind. Although that I would say economy is also very on top of their mind. Mm -hmm. um, but on the political ideological side of things, that uh, you see that this uh in the ecological uh, uh civilization building in the in the party chapter. You see that it's it's not something that you just build there and then you phase out. That you know, earlier this year they also have a more, uh, the state council have a more um, kind of this this um, mandate the implementation of that of the of that of the, of the idea. So I think from that end, it it's it's quite intangible. You know, it's it's about methodology, uh, you know, philosophy. It's about vision. Uh, it's not as as specific as a policy instrument. But I think that actually, to some extent, reflect the priority of the government. That what they see is a legacy of of this this government. Um, I think that was the uh, one way to take it. Uh, uh, I think that would be very helpful lens to to think about it. Uh, what, what was the question? Uh, oh yes, the uh, um, the division of labor. So I am saying that the ministries uh, they are increasing prayer. They are playing their part in the respective sectors. So we see action from MOHA on building sector. We see action from uh, from Ministry of Transport in the transportation sector. We see, you know, uh, Ministry of uh, what the Ministry is, um, in, uh, National in uh, Energy Administration actions on renewable energies on coal. We see very concrete action on the Min sector Ministry of Industry. I mean, the industri industrial folks are also yeah, under and then pressure. yes, the MIT they focus on the industries efficiencies and you know and the others as well. So. That's why I meant that you know they are actually have a predefined responsibility that working on their sectors to achieve that. So it's not it's, it's not something else. It's not somebody else's job. It's it's part of my job. That's very good. Uh, what I said as well, the post coordination part is that they need to work better together. Yeah. That is uh is something that need to be improved. You know, not only you know among these different policies that sometimes sometimes they are contradicting, uh at the at the implementation level. One 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 example for example the energy saving targets so every uh, enterprises well, big enterprises they're given our uh, energy saving target to be achieved right so for example you have to achieve um, 18 percent for example just for example 18 percent of energy saving uh, in terms of intensity um, as this post instrument uh, you know another part of NRC have this ED, well our local government have this emission trading scheme so but that that the the the, the, the the way that emission trading schemes work is that I don't need necessarily need to reduce my emissions. I can pay others to, to do the reduction for me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that under these energy saving targets, I am responsible to, to do emission on my end, no matter if you meet the emission tra trading you know, allowance or not. So these two policies, to some extent, they are contradicting because can I, can I pay someone else to do the reduction or not? Um, because this policy is telling me I can, but this policy is telling me I can, and the, the source are the same, you know, to a large extent. Um, so there's a lot of things to sort out, the details and the implementation uh, specifications. 
um, I think that's the uh, that's what need to be improved over time, and to in to make sure that if we have the ETS, we have a robust ETS. If we go going through the other way, that we have risk move out, we have no questions left, and then we know what to do. Okay. I think we if it's, uh, there was the woman there in the black, and then we'll do Judy. So we'll gather two, maybe three down if you're nice. Yeah, thank you. My name is Suzanne Frater with Resustain. I would like you to elaborate a little bit on the energy sector and on coal again, given that what the imp or asking what the impact um, and effect of the amendments can be um, on a backdrop of, um, on the one hand, declining coal consumption presently and potentially in the near future, but also looking at the lower coal prices and so potentially more attraction to consume more coal. Um, so given that the amendment addresses um, the provisions to increase the use of renewables, I would like to have you explore a little bit on, on the energy mix implications of the amendments. Okay, Thank and then and then we could have Judy up front here asking a quick question too. We'll just gather two together. And you need to tell everyone who you are, Judy. I'm Judy Shapiro from American University. Um, so I can't help noticing we've been talking for a long time about air pollution in China, and nobody has mentioned the Tianjin explosion, which was a humongous air pollution and water pollution accident. And so I guess I'd like to have the three of you yep. and Jennifer too um, put that into context from your perspective. We were waiting. We knew someone would ask that. We actually mm. talked about it. Should we talk about it? Then we'll have some in the audience bring it up because it'll make it'll come up at a time when it makes sense. All right, we got two questions here: the coal price and the port explosion. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Well, maybe just one minor point on the on the coal price. Um, maybe there's an opportunity here if the prices are declining because we had the question before about um, is it possible to for China to move towards an, uh, an even more robust. Uh, uh, commitment on climate. And I think one of the things that that question um, leads to is, well, can you reform the pricing for energy in China? If you can do that, then perhaps you could uh, reduce emissions even further and reduce emissions intensity. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of vested interest there. Um, as I understand that even still today, the pricing for electricity does uh, forget about reflecting the externalities of the the cost of the pollution. It doesn't even reflect the actual cost of bringing the uh, the electricity onto the grid uh, and, and into the into the uh, down to the consumer. Um, so if maybe I'm just wondering if maybe the price decline would offer an opportunity to start that process of reforming the pricing. And uh, maybe the anti-corruption campaign is also going to have an impact on who is who is deciding these things in China. Um, so just to throw that out there, and then maybe we can yeah. circle back to Tianjin yeah. later. And, and and I should note that on the 29th, I'm going to have um, Rick Weston from the Regulatory Assistance Pro Project um, come in. We're going to be also talking about air and climate, kind of a same topic, but from a different angle, looking at the power sector more deeply, because you guys are all DC nerds in terms of policy in China. So you'll you will all flock to that meeting too. So, but yeah, yeah, that that's definitely. I mean, pricing in the power sector is a, that that's going to be a whole meeting. But I think that's. But also that saving. If your coal is not costing you as much, you could in theory have you know as an investor, you have more money to you know maybe maybe I will pay for this more expensive renewables. Mm -hmm. Question mark. I mean, I've had some people have speculated that. Mm -hmm. I think we we have this you know another discussion the other day. I mean, two 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 months ago in China that what is a good time? Is that is economy is good? It's a good time because you know you can <laughs> you can have more afford to to do more aggressive action because more money you don't need to worry about the economy. Or is that when it's down is a good time, right? Because you know. Um, you have less resistance. It's anyway. never a good time, right? <laughs> exactly. That's never a good time. I think I think the way to take it, uh, the way I take it is like, um, the pricing. Of course, the economy will have its will work its way. And the other way is like, the the fundamental way I understand Chinese economy. I'm not economist, but the way that I understand it, I read. But well, um, it's like the old development pathways that by burning coal, by you know fueling all the heavy industries, energy intensive industries. Have has reached its limit to 
to further boost Chinese economy. So you don't if, even if you burn all the coal, if you do all the you know keep the input output of this uh, energy intensive industries high, you know steel, cement, uh, all the way high, it won't help a lot because you basically already hit the ceiling on that on that mode. You don't have too much demand for that. You know there's limited effort that you can you can you can you can export. So why not just take the opportunities? And if it's not going to help your economy anyway, and I think I think that idea been more and more mainstream now, um, then we, it's, it's a good time. It's a good time to, to do that, beca not because that's good for the environment, just because that the other way is not good for the economy anyway. So I think that's that's my uh, my one take on that. Okay. Do it. Uh, we can do, are we going to talk about the port? Yeah. Uh, if you want to talk about coal may, price too, uh, they'll take may, both. Maybe on coal, because uh, we're just fascinated <laughs> by coal. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, maybe let, let me try to conceptualize your question a little bit. I think you are essentially asking to what extent environmental consideration can be or should be factored in to the more economic-oriented discussions, such as energy, right? I mean, uh, I, think, I think that's, that's an ongoing process in China. I think you, you, you see environmental consideration making its way gradually. Again, it's, it's an incremental process, sometimes too slow. Um, but it's different from a few years ago. Um, and I think um, in terms of this new amendment, um, I think it captured some of the languages there, as you mentioned, for example, renewable energy it has some language on coal as well. Um, but we didn't see new language or additional language there. Um, it captured some of the languages that have already appeared in previous policies. Um, so that's, um, I, guess, I guess, one thing. Um, well, what do you mean by ca the law captured it? You mean just saying that to encourage renewables? or? Yeah, to encourage renewable, trying to uh, you know, make sure that they are prioritized uh, in terms of great connection. And the that, dispatch, that's already, okay, the dispatch, you know, okay. That's, that's already that's in the around. renewable energy law. That's, that's already been there for several years. Um, it's good to have those languages, um, but to what extent it will be implemented, uh, especially it will be implemented from an environmental point of view. Um, I think we still have some way to go. I, I wouldn't envision just one or two single legislation changing the whole picture or the whole power dynamic there. Um, on Tianjin, um, Julie, good to see, see you here. I, I was in one of our uh, global environmental policy class uh, seven years ago, so that's, that's a long time ago. But yeah, good to see you here. Um, I think Tianjin shows you the perfect example of having a law, but only putting the law on the paper. I, I mean, I'm not a chemical expert, but my chemical colleague, colleagues can tell you we have different provisions, different regulations, policies, laws, different instruments that deals in particular with this kind of situation, where you should store, you know, how far it should stay away from residential area. It's all there. It's on paper. It shows you the perfect example. If it is only on paper, what might happen? So again, how do we make use of the law? How do we activate the law? And uh, for changing, and actually, you know, tracing back a little bit, you know, Qingdao, right, a few years back, there's also mm -hmm. a big explosion. And how this uh, specific or individual accidents can inform, can help to shape the discussion. I mean, yes, the paper is, is you know, the law is not being, res are, are not being res respected. So this, this, this kind of big event accidents that caught everybody off guard, that I think is a good opportunity to shade line on that. I think Greenpeace did a really good piece of you know highlighting how other you know uh, park cities that they're having the same problems, mm -hmm. and I think that's you know capturing the public momentum and media attention to shade line on this and hopefully put more, more uh, constraints on these kind of things. You know the same as the Qingdao you know explosion. I think um, more broadly speaking, I see I actually see that the explosion personally. Uh, having impact on the Qingdao's government's thinking about the arrangement of their petrochemical industries, um, I the I think they are not going to they were they were trying to rebuild it you know move to another place as a bigger 
bigger one. Um, but I think they think it twice now, and they will be, be more much more cautious approach now. I think that's a, that's a good uh, lessons learned from them because you know at least from in in that specific a, uh, case that I think that's actually contribute to a lot to Qingdao's own commitment to peak earlier. Well, yeah. Qingdao is one of the low carbon cities that, um, as, 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 as a local city, that they commit to peak. Uh, I don't quite remember the number, but uh, the year, but it was way earlier than the than national as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, you know, as a country. Yeah. So how how do we capture the, the momentum and how we make best use of it? Uh, you know, thanks to Greenpeace, I think that the, the, um, the Tianjin um, media attention was pretty good, and you know that highlighted the violation of laws, mm -hmm. and then highla highlighting the cost of relying too much on this kind of you know chemical is also energy intensive. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but but also but also you know I'd like to note too that you know here we are today we're talking about the air law, and you know there's been movement on the water stuff, but waste. Occasionally I have waste issues, and not very many people even come to those meetings. Waste is just not sexy. But I mean, but that's just, don't you think that, that you don't have as robust? I mean, the, again, there's stuff on paper, but there's not a lot of, a lot of other, you know, with the, with the, with, well, the, with the campaigns and you know. I, I think that's uh, that's part of it, but I think only part of it. You yeah? know, with okay. the Tianjin tragedy, um, it is in part about law in the books versus the law in practice. But but it's also I think about the larger power dynamics, right? This is the the same push and pull that we see in the environmental area between the reformers and the vested interests. And the, you know this this idea that you can get away with kind of weak, weak implementation of public safety uh, standards. Uh, well, Tianjin just explodes that, right? It blows it up, and you yeah. know because there's <laughs> there's health impacts. No pun intended. There's yeah. huge economic disruption, and and there's loss of face uh, when something like that happens, and people react to it. They see that, and you know we're shocked by it because because it's appalling, but we're not surprised at all, right? That something like that. Would happen, and you know that the company, you know, as there seemed to be uncovering that the company apparently was using political connections to ensure that the facility got approved, even though it was within, uh, you know, too close. Uh, it was within the buffer zone uh, from the residences. But but another issue that I think hasn't gotten quite as much attention, but maybe even more important about is about what was going on inside that facility. You know, was was with was there tracking? Was there an inventory of what was there? Was that inventory provided to the officials? Was it disclosed publicly? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in in the U.S. after the Bhopal incident in the '80s, uh, th there was a new law passed because we had you know we had practices that were quite dangerous, uh, uh, even even that recently. Um, and so the, the law in the U.S. is called the Emergency Planning and, and Community Right to Know Act. Um, requires local governments to prepare uh, um, chemical emergency response plans to dis report the information to the government, the facility, and then to disclose it to the public um, to uh, uh, make w what they call material safety data sheets Available. These are, you know, information essentially on each of the hazardous chemicals that's being stored um, to make that available to the officials, to the government officials, especially the fire departments. Right? There was yeah. this whole issue about whether the yeah. fire departments had adequate information. There's a way to prevent that. Right? You, you need to provide that information to the fire department so when they go to that address, they know what's there and they know if they need to use different means because they're fighting a chemical fire rather than uh, a regular fire. So, you know, there, there are things you can do to deal with these issues. Um, we've tried to deal with them through that law. Then you need to, of course, really implement the law and not just leave it, leave it there on the books or leave ways for the powerful companies to get away around having to comply with it. Um, but I think it's a real wake-up call, and I think also sort of the economic impacts of this are going to be really profound because there's all these other companies that operate at that port that had to shut down mm -hmm. for a period of time. They can't be very happy with this kind of lax regulation and where it, where it leads. Did, I was curious, does, does the, I don't know if you know this, it, it, does the U.S. EPA, do, have we been cooperating with China on this, you know, community right to know kind of legislation or, or regulations? It doesn't leap into my mind, I don't recall. 
That's a good question. I think th th there's there's two parts to the uh, to, to EPCA. One is community right to know, and the other is emergency planning. And emergency planning. Um, I think there's been some there's been some work on uh, waste prevention of uh, hazardous uh, of sites contaminated with hazardous chemicals um, and remediation, but less on the sort of emergency response yeah, part. Yeah. There has been some cooperation on the community right to know issue, and this, this is something that we've had a lot of discussions with the Chinese officials about, is, is this idea of requiring companies to publicly disclose mm -hmm. what, uh, what pollutants they are storing, what pollutants they are releasing, uh, and then let that kind of public pressure uh, operate to, uh, to, to, to induce stronger controls. Okay, well, good. Maybe one, one or two more questions. So Don and anyone else? Okay, Don, you'll be our closing pitcher, it looks like. Because it's Friday afternoon, everyone's getting sleepy. Mm -hmm. Or is that the only uh, thing uh, between you guys uh, on the weekend? Yes, I know, I'm blocking your weekend. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, Donald Barnes, South China University of Technology in Guangzhou. Uh, just for the record, uh, we w were in Beijing from, I think it was June 18 to June 22. And we saw blue sky four days in a row. And the Beijingers were out taking pictures of the sky. We had lived there for four years, and we'd never seen anything like that before. And as far as I know, there are no military parades or international meetings. Uh, so, so there was that. Uh, the, the, the other item I was alluded to here, but I'd just like to get your take on it. And that is this whole idea of the corruption. Uh, <clears throat> the president is making a, a tremendous effort to try to clean that up. How much of, of the environmental problem has a, a corruption aspect to it. And if President Xi is able to clean house, how much would that do to improve the environment? Clean up corruption, clean the skies. That was a short, that was the, the Twitter version, tweet, tweeting version of his question. Yes, what do you guys think? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, I can tell you uh, there, there was one uh, quite high level official in the MEP uh, who was investigated. Um, for uh, corruption uh, charges. Uh, that happened, I think, just fairly recently, one or two months ago. Was it uh, related to a specific? Yeah, yeah, I think it was actually the, the vice minister. Yeah. And I think um, the part of the issue there was the sort of collusion on environmental impact assessments, okay. uh, which I think is a pretty big issue, right? That, 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 that there are what look on paper to be pretty strong in environmental impact assessment requirements in China. Um, but as we saw in Tianjin, they're skirted <laughs> and evaded and, uh, you know, often uh, don't have much of an impact. And that may be simple lack of implementation, or there may also be a corruption component to it. And I think the issue was that there were the, something about the firms that do the impact assessments yeah. and whether they were in some kind of you know illicit collusion with yeah. with companies do we know that apropos uh, tianjin again that i mean because a lot of times when there's big accidents like someone you know off with your head i mean you know like shei jen shei had to leave map or then sipa after the song well, there's 20 people school. that were detained for so there are people detained, but in terms some of, of them from companies but it's from the company, company and some from the government none from, and from the government? And from the government, yeah. But that was yeah. more at the city level. I was just curious if there's going to be a, a ripple effect. Well, the, the I think I saw something from the industry ministry um, saying we were trying to get 100 of these facilities to either upgrade or move uh, further from residences. But the local opposition was too strong. Okay. The same old story. Yeah, it's like we got um, So he had, his ex he had his excuse ready. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if they actually <laughs> were trying and, and that's yeah. what happened or, or what. But, it, you know, it's the same governance issues that we're seeing again in this context. And again and again. Maybe just, uh, um, I guess, on, on corruption, it also depends on how broadly do you define corruption. Bribery or, you know, just sitting there, you know, not implementing uh, policies. If you define that broadly, I do see addressing corruption will help quite a bit, especially on law enforcement. Um, but, you know, this is an ongoing campaign, and this is much larger than um, only the environment. But I do see the problem um, to a large extent being that 
you have law, you have quite good languages. They are not utilized. Nobody have the political incentive to implement or enforce them. Uh, and that's the problem. Um, and if you define that as corruption, then uh, address that. You will improve our quality a little bit. Any other final and comment? I, I think that's the basically the same story. And uh, you do have that you know level issues there. And Tianjin, you know, the the head of the National Safety Ex Inspection Bureau mm -hmm. was just uh, you know being investigated. It's not know that well they had. The, the, this individual will, has some linkage with Tianjin, and uh, but it's not known that this, this investigation is linked to the Tianjin explosion. But um, well, at least that you know someone having been in investigation, and you know as an environment impact assessment that there's a uh, this uh, widespread media coverage lately in China that um, the, the 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 ministry MEP trying to clean up the EIA system. You know there you know some 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 companies have the, have the qualification are selling the qualification to some outsource them. And then who can do it cheaply, and they just sell, you know, boring, letting out their co qualifications. So there's also an issue they're trying to clean that up. So in, in vast level, yes, and and I think the nature of corruption is that they're the hidden, right? It's really mm -hmm. difficult to see in the public eyes. Otherwise, it's already been talked about. So that would be <laughs> difficulty of. That. Well, all right. So we the the theme today was the air pollution law in China, and we talked about so many other things, which was yeah. fabulous. Can I want you guys to applaud one more time, please, for our lovely speakers? for what I'm going to dub the Air Pollution Happy Hour Talk. Um, and that, as I noted before, 29th, we're going to be examining air pollution from another angle. And um, I have to thank the Luce Foundation that's supporting the China Environment Forum on our choke point port cities, which is looking at, we're looking at, Shen, the case is looking at Shenzhen and Oakland, Shenzhen, China, and Oakland, California, looking at how each of those cities, their, how their energy, use and development is impacting water and water's energy footprint and what this means for their pollution story. And we actually will have, someone talked about ports at the beginning, we actually have a, we, we commissioned, we have a, a technical report coming out on Shenzhen's port and their shore power and, you know, hoo-hoo. I, I hopped on that boat going to the shore, shore the port stuff too. So I um, want to thank all of you for coming and hanging out with us today and Go, oh, yeah, and the air, the air quality in D.C. is 43 on our AQI. Oh. <laughs> For ozone, though, so, you know, but, you know, so it's a question that was Beijing, though, and like with your, sta with your standard, well, you're not in Beijing right now, but Beijing standards that what they're calling good and what we call good, maybe there's hmm. a wee bit of difference. But anyway, it's still pretty good air out there, so go out and enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.